are all, in one way or the other, in a state of wilderness. I don't know how many of you have been to a real wilderness, but I'm sure all of us have been to spiritual wilderness, where you look all around, and all you see is yourself. There is nobody there. If you are coming from the Middle East, you have seen it physically. You know, you can be in a desert. I've been in so many time, so many times in Kuwait as a service engineer driving around in the desert road all around. There won't be any cars, there won't be anything, just long road and desert and just me, you know. So, uh, but spiritually, that kind of experiences can happen to us too. Sometimes even we won't, we won't even find God. We wonder, where is God? And I'm doing all these things uh, for the name of God, or if I'm, 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 I'm believing this and I'm trying to do all the right things, but I can't see God. Where is God? And uh, so this is a question. This is an experience of wilderness in so many ways we, we, we experience. And, but that is also, like I mentioned last week, it is also a time of birthing. God uses, right? Like I used an analogy of a womb just last quick minute. And it was, I don't know if how many of you even caught it. Because it is like a wilderness is like being in a mother's womb. And that mother's womb is where the actual birthing process happens. And it's like a larva coming into this little cocoon, right? Larva, so ugly, so dead you don't want to look at it. But it sits in the cocoon in the wilderness, in the loneliness, that in that cocoon, it, it sits there, and then it comes out like the beautiful butterfly everyone wants to look at. So it's that birthing process is the wilderness. And, and in Christ's ministry itself, it was a birthing process. The Jesus who went into that wilderness was not the same Jesus who came out in the sense, in the sense he graduated into a different realm of ministry. At, to that time, he was a 30-year-old man who was basically a carpenter helping his dad and mom and, you know, the family, you know, just like an ordinary person. But this wilderness came in just before his graduation pro process. That's why I said, even though we call it a temptation, it was actually a test. A test is something which is good for us, even though we don't like it, because it will give, it will be a stepping stone into the next realm of our life, our ministry, our career, what have you. So the experience of wilderness, even though we don't appreciate it, it is the part and parcel of God's plan for all of us. Now one thing I wanted to assure you today, and my sermon today is, so yes, it is for good, but then the experience of being in the wilderness is so horrible. How can we survive here? How can we remain here and still having that hope, right? And one other way we do is, obviously, because this wilderness is a place where Jesus has already gone before us, right? Today we just read Jesus went to the wilderness because he was led by the Spirit, right? So wilderness is not always we end up. It's a place we end up. Oh, man, how do you? No. We are led by the Spirit at some time. So there is a plan. There is a purpose behind it. And we see Jesus in the wilderness. So we are not here alone. Somebody has gone before us. And that is the beauty of Jesus' ministry. Like, you know, I've, I, I'll read you, uh, I'll read a couple verses. Hebrew chapter 2, 18 says, For he himself was tested, and he is able to come to the aid of those who are tested. So Jesus was being tested in this wilderness, not because he had to graduate or he had to pass some examination or something like that. He was the son of God, right? Jesus didn't need a wilderness. Jesus didn't need a, a test or procedures like that. But he has experienced this, whatever we are going through before us. So we, he can be uh, the right savior when we are going through the same situation. Does that make sense? It's the same thing like, you know, when Jesus took baptism. Did Jesus need baptism? I don't know. <laughs> even, the, even the baptizer himself said, what do, what do you mean? I don't have to baptize you. You have to baptize me. He knew Jesus didn't baptize, uh, do baptism. But, but he did that so that it will set an example for us. 
It is for our sake. So whatever is happening in Jesus' life is actually happening in a way for us, for us to identify or for him to identify with us. Does that make sense? Okay, another word says, Hebrew chapter 415, same idea. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. So here is, we are saying, like, you know, the, the God, Christianity presence is a God who is not just out there, but he is here and he has been tempted the same way we have been. Yet, he turned that temptation into a test and came out without any sin. So he can sympathize with us. No other God in the history of religion can sympathize with us because God is God and we are just humble human beings. But the God of Christianity says that I've been there before you. I've been in that wilderness before you. So I know what you're going through. Whatever pain you're going through, there is nothing that is new to me. I can understand. I can. So the high priest we have is somebody who can sympathize with us. And that sympathy, uh, you know, that, that credibility, credibility, this God has because of what we read now. He has been tested or tempted, which came out as a test, which he graduated, right? So always make it very clear that when we read the scripture, the way we need to read it is like we ourselves have to be in that position of Jesus. Because Jesus is being tested for us. So we have to see ourselves in this picture. It has to be our story. Jesus is like a stand-in. You know, you know what a stand-in is? You know, when I lived in Madras, you know, when it was Madras, before Chennai, back in the days, one of my hobby was that going and visit all the movie studios at night. Night, night, there will be a lot of shooting. We live right in Wadawalni, Kodambak in that area. We'll go, you know, I was just 20 something like Anderson Atkinson, young, and I could do anything. So I had this, <clears throat> we had this uh, little uh, identity ca ID cards from American Library and British Library. It was all free. Nobody knew that American in Madras, they give a free membership and they also give this nice free IDs which looks very foreign, right? And back in the 80s, and, and then the studios are so secured, so protected, you cannot walk in unless you are a movie star, right? Or unless you are somebody special. So we always walk in with this ID card from the American Library or British Library in our, and you know, the poor security guards, and not all of them are very educated, so we just show the ID. Right? And they walk in, sir, 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 come on in. So they think we are some kind of movie stars or journalists or whatever, right? So, you know, it's just a piece of cake, just wa walk in the park or whatever you say. So we always used to watch uh, movie, movie shooting. It was, it was kind of a fun thing for us to do at night. night. So when you watch this, and the fun thing is especially about this dance sequence you see in Bollywood movies, which you don't see in any other movies. So this dance sequence that come up, you see in the screen maybe three to five minutes, but they take three to five weeks to just do one dance. It's such a difficult process. They do the repeat, you know, again and again. And then you have these movie stars. When you look at them and you, you watch on the screen and say, man, how could they do so beautifully? And, you know, they, they would be doing break dance one day, another day disco, or another day Bharatanatyam, Mohiniyatam, all this. I mean, like, they must be amazingly talented. That's what we think when we see them on the screen. But actually, when you do in the shooting set, they are just like puppets. Because there are expert Bharatanatyam or Mohiniyatam or like a break dance experts coming in. When they do the shooting, and they will do the stand-in, they're the expert. They will do these shots again and again, and then the movie stars just sit there and watch. And then they teach the movie stars just the step one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. So they give us the beat and the rhythm or what, what have you. And then, just before they switch out the camera, the movie star goes and just do one, two, three. They have no clue what they are doing. They have no idea about the soul of this dance or the move or anything. They are just following this one, two, three, one, two, three, four from the expert. Does that make sense? You, you know, you know. So, the the whole picture I'm trying to paint is when I, I when when we read the scripture, it is kind of like that, in the sense Jesus is the expert. He is somebody who has been tested. 
yet without sin. Tempted, yet without sin. Because he is a pro. He knows what he is doing. But he is doing this so that when we come to our own wilderness, like a movie star, right? We just watch it. We just learn from this so that we can stand in. When the camera is on us, we can go in and mimic in a way, mimic in a way what Jesus is doing. That's why the scripture says the high priest we have is somebody who can sympathize with us. And somebody, because he himself was tested, he's able to come to the aid of us. So what we are seeing in the scripture for this, this other nine verses we read today is actually that cosmic dance sequence unfolding with an expert dancer in the scene so that we can watch and learn and practice, apply that in our life. So this is not just Jesus' story. It is our story. It is our temptation. So first one, the first temptation. So let me read this. This is what the, it says. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Right? You know, when I was teaching in a seminary classroom, you know, I walked into the classroom to teach, and the, the students were having a big argument, seminary students, right? And they're arguing with something silly. Some, most of the time, seminary students' argument can be very silly. Like, you remember Jesus came in, Jesus' disciples were arguing, who is to be the best? I'm the best, you're the best, right? Silly, right? You know, even the other people won't kind of argue that. Anyway, so anyway, they, they had this silly argument about which is the best miracle Jesus did. Like, sound like a Sunday school argument, right? So which is the best miracle Jesus did? Somebody said, oh, you know, you know, healing the, you know, you know, the blind man's opening the blind man's eye or walking on water or, oh, Lazar, you know, he was dead for four days in the Jesus. So they asked me, they, so they said, oh, I said, what are you guys discussing? So this is the, so, so they said, oh, so what do you think? What do you think? What do you think, professor? <laughs> what do you think, which is the best miracle? So I thought, oh, this is a, this is a great way to teach them something, right? I said, oh, the best miracle Jesus did, in my opinion, is that, remember that turning stone into bread? They said, what? Yeah, that, that episode was turning stone into bread? They said, well, that's not a miracle. Why? They said, well, because Jesus didn't turn the bread, turn the stone into bread. When he, if he turned stone into bread, it's a miracle. They said, let's pause there for a minute. Do you think Jesus could have turned that stone into bread? Of course, right? Of course. You don't think so? He, he could have. And do you think there was anything wrong in turning that stone into bread? Because you had to read that scripture very carefully, clear, clearly. Um, the tempter came to him when? He, before that, he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He then became hungry. So he fasted for 40 days. The fasting is done. Technically, what Satan is saying, I know he's Satan, I know he's a bad guy, but he's not really saying anything bad here. See, if he came on the 39th day and asked Jesus to turn, then he is bad. He's trying to break Jesus' fast. No, he's not a bad guy. He's just saying, well, you were fasting, look at you, 40 days, 40 nights, you're done, successful, everything is done. Now, is there anything, I mean, I don't know. I still don't think there was anything wrong in turning the stone into bread. He, he was capable of that. So they said, yeah, that's right. He could have turned stone into bread, but he didn't. So I said, that's a big miracle. You know, when you have power to do something, but you don't do it, because you wanted to, there is, a, there is an underlying principle behind it. I'll tell you, the, the biggest temptation you can have in your life, and particularly in ministry, is to use your own talents and your own gifts for your own sake. Okay? Now, if you look at Jesus' life, okay, let me, let me give you another example. Recently, <laughs> in the internet I read, not the internet, it was all over the media, there was a big TV preacher, television evangelist, I won't say his name, he issued a plea, or he was asking people for donation to buy a new private jet. 
the one he has, he already has a private jet, which is kind of old. So he wanted to replace it. He wanted a new one, right? Like a, so he wanted some 100, 120 million or 90 million or something, not that much. <laughs> so he wanted money. Right? So he was asking for money. And then I thought, man, how ridiculous that is. And then I was reading his plea letter. It was all in the internet. So he's explaining why he needed that jet. He is saying that, you know, when he goes and he has to preach all over the world, when he goes to LAX or whichever airport you go, you know, you fly and go to the TSA, the harassment, the, you know, I'm the big lineup and big weight. And when you really look at this, you know, I have to travel around the world on an everyday basis. I have to save the world. There are a lot of people are hungry for the word of God. I cannot reach everywhere unless I have a private jet. And the way he has written, it's so convincingly written and I'm, I, I felt like sending him $10 or $20, right? Because it was so convincing. <laughs> that, that's right. That's right. The pastors need a private jet, right? The offering is coming up, by the way. We, we, you know, so just uh, all I'm asking for is a car. I, I don't want a private jet, but you know, just joking. <laughs> but, but do you get that? Like, you know, people think all these things will make it easy so that they can. So then I looked at Jesus. You know, one of the beautiful things about Jesus, he has never, ever used not even one miracle for his own benefit. He walked all the way from Galilee to Jerusalem. That's around 70 miles. 70 miles. Why? If I was Jesus, I wouldn't do that. I would just fly. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, if I'm the son of God, and of course Jesus could have flown. I mean, right? Jesus did all those miracles. He could have made his life a little easy, right? He could have, he could have just, and, and he could have saved, I don't know how, how long it will take, at least a day for walking 70 miles, you know, or two days. And he could have saved that day, that time, by, by making his life easy, by flying. He's not hurting anybody. It's his power. But he never, ever used this gift for his own benefit. Does that make sense? See, I mean, one place he was hungry, and then he was looking at a tree, and he was, oh, he went there hoping that the, the tree has some fruit, and he didn't see any fruit, and then, you know, the whole cursing story and all that. Then I'm thinking, why? Didn't you just fed 5,000 plus 4,000 people just before? You had to go to the tree <laughs> looking for fruit? What is wrong? Why don't you make some bread? You can. Nobody is going to find fault with that, including Satan. Nobody is going to accuse Jesus for making some food for himself when he's hungry. See, the gift, see, this is the real miracle. See, the real miracle is not always something you do. Something what you don't do can be a miracle too. See, that's why Gandhi learned this from Jesus. He admitted that. How did India get its independence? It get its independence. Because Gandhi had this completely different strategy which British couldn't know, they didn't know how to handle it. Because Gandhi wouldn't fight back even when he could. Because the British knew how to, how to, you know, when somebody rise up, you know, all that kind of stuff, they don't, they know how to handle it. But when somebody doesn't fight back, they don't know how to handle it. So Gandhi's miracle he learned from Jesus, not fighting back, even though he had the power. He had all the people around him. The point I'm trying to make is, one of the biggest temptations we can have in our life is to use our gifts, use our position, our power for our own sake. Now, that sounds familiar to you? That sounds familiar to you, right? So nobody has asked us to turn stone into bread, but believe it or not, every day, Every day, somebody is asking you to do that same thing in your life. If you understand the practical application of it, to use our gift for our own sake. Let me jump to the next one real quick. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. What a change of scene, right? From this desert to suddenly the next scene is the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against stone. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to test. So what do you think? 
So what do you think? If Jesus had just thrown himself down, if Jesus just jumped down, do you think he would have died at that moment? No, right? Because Jesus came with a plan and purpose, which is eventually the Calvary, the cross. Everything is predestined and everything is, you know, the Lamb of God, which is slain. So, so if Jesus had jumped, nothing would have happened, right? But he says, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, I don't, I'm not going to test the promise. Because Satan, again, if you really look at it without any biased point of view. What Satan is quoting is a great scripture we all use sometime. And Satan is actually right in saying what he is right. But Jesus has a very different uh, way of handling. And what does this mean to us? See, so Jesus is this, the pinnacle of the temple, right? So everybody knows, or everybody at least Satan, and Jesus know that he is the Messiah. Right? He is the Messiah who is come to redeem Israel first and then the rest of the world. So normally what the Messiahs do, so Jesus is not the first Messiah. There are so many Messiahs come and go at the time of Jesus, just before Jesus. This is a fascinating study and which we will be incorporating in our study, a Tuesday Bible study coming up. We'll make that announcement later. But just to give you a quick overview of just some quick example, how many of you have heard about the Jewish festival of Hanukkah? Hanukkah, right? Hanukkah is a very famous Jewish festival. You know what the story of Hanukkah is? Around 200 years ago, exactly 160 BC, somewhere around that, exactly 200 years before Jesus, this man, Judas Maccabeus, he came up, he, 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 he came up as a big leader in the Jewish history. And he, he actually fought the battle against the, the whole dynasty at the time, Antioch and all the Syrian dynasty and all that, and, and the, the temple was captured by the Syrians. And he, would, he basically recaptured the temple, and people considered him as the Messiah. Just 200 years before Jesus came this guy, this Messiah, he was a nice guy, he was a great guy, important part in Jewish history. And the first thing he did was, once he did, won the battle, he went to the temple and he did a miracle. Well, he, he didn't do the miracle, but it became a miracle which we know as Hanukkah. The, the story is this, he went and lit the menorah, right? Like the Jewish, uh, the candlestick with the, with all that different uh, petals and all that kind of stuff, right? So, so basically, different branches, sorry. So, so he lit that, and he only had oil just for one day. Just for one day. So this new Messiah goes to the temple and lits, and he lits the, the menorah, and with that one day oil, the, oil, the miracle of oil is such that the, the lamb continued to light for eight days with this one day's oil. So that's why if you know, the Hanukkah is celebrated for eight days. And they call it the miracle of oil. The reason I'm saying is, if you are the Messiah, the best place to start your ministry is right from the pinnacle of the temple. So basically, the Satan is saying, you are the Messiah, I know that. People don't know that yet. I know that you are the Messiah. And you know that you are the Messiah. And why are you wasting another three and a half years of your life to prove to the world that you are the Messiah? Time is here. Time is now. Look at what other Messiahs have done. Just, just do a big miracle by jumping down. I know you won't touch the ground. I know you will float in the air. Everybody look up and say, here is the Messiah. So Satan is essentially saying to Jesus, take a shortcut to your success. You are the Messiah, I know. But take a shortcut. Don't go through this three and a half years of walking and being hungry and, and eventually ending up crucified. Why? Why? You can do it right here, right now. Take a shortcut to success. Have you heard that ever before? Have you heard that ever before? Oh, I bet, I'm, I'm sure that you must have heard that probably every day. Of course, nobody asked you to jump from the top of a building, but Satan says the same thing to you in different ways. Matthew, why do you waste your time doing this? I want you to succeed, Matthew. Let's drive in the fast lane. 
Let's drive in the fast lane. This is too slow. Why do you want to waste doing this kind of There are different ways of being a star in ministry or in doing anything you do, right? And I, I, want, I want to be here with you. So, so let's do this together. And so let's take a shortcut, don't drive in the fast lane. That's why many, many big evangelists end up getting crashed. Right? Like you see their name in one day and like this big, amazing servant of God. And the next day you read them, they end up in, it's not the, you know, in a way I feel bad for them because they are pushed to drive on the fast lane, to be into everywhere in the media, to write all the books they want, to make all the movies they want, and to put them ourselves there and to make uh, 5,000 Facebook friends and put viral videos out there. And there are different ways of being a star in, 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 in the social media world. And the temptation is so high for everybody, each and every one of us to take that shortcut. But God, you know, the, the beauty of that is, you know, recently one of my mentors told me, Matthew, the real gift is the journey itself. The real gift is the journey itself. We used to love going road trip because people think that, oh, it's crazy with all these kids, you know, you know. In a way, and we, it doesn't matter. It didn't matter where we are going to go. Or we, go, we want to go to Atlanta. Sure, let's go. Let's drive. Go to Chicago. Let's drive. And we always drove because it was so fun being in the car with the kids, and they will have their little nursery songs, and we will be playing some games, and we stop at McDonald's, and you know, it's the, you know, it's the, the road trip in a way brought our family closer and closer and closer together. The, the destination didn't really matter. It didn't matter where we were going, but we all looked for, now they are all grown up and they don't, no, we had to fly, you know, just, no, we, we don't want to be in the car, you know, we have to fly, because they, they, they are growing up. In a way, we are also, yeah, that's right, yeah, I can't drive, you know, we are getting older too. But the, the, the point I'm trying to make is, the joy of the road trip is the, is the road trip itself. It doesn't matter where you're going. It is the journey, right? You will remember that after a while, right? You know, that, that, that the whole trip to New York, how, how it kind of brought you guys together, how you shared some of the stuff you wouldn't get time to share in a normal day, the way you connected with your children, the way you connected with the environment, the way you looked at the nature, the way you looked at, the way you thought about God and all this kind of stuff. That's what it means. The journey is the gift, not the destination. The destination itself is not the gift, but it's the journey. It's the journey itself is a gift. So God wants us to reach. When, when, when God puts us on a path, it is not about destination. We are so preoccupied with the God's plan for me. Oh, God wants to me, me to be this person uh, five years from now, two years from now. You know, typical interview question, where do you see yourself in the next three years, next five years? We are so preoccupied in a culture which is completely about what is going to, where are we going to go? But God is saying, that's not the point. Where you are right now. I want you to enjoy the ride. This is what builds up your family. This is what, what builds your character. So do not try to take a shortcut. When God gives you a journey, when God puts you in a path, enjoy the ride. Don't worry about where you are going to end up or where you are. That's not for, a, for you to decide. So this temptation is very personal too for us. Take a shortcut to success. The third one I'll quickly go to here is, you know, the devil is saying, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdom of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Right? So God, Satan shows him all these kingdoms and all glory. And he basically, basically, gives a deal. He, he gives Jesus a deal, right? And basically he is saying that compromise. Let's both of us win. We will both win. This is a win-win situation. How many times you have heard this? Win-win situation, right? Let's compromise. Let's make a compromise. Here is the kingdom and the glory. I don't want it. I'm tired of it. I'm going to give everything to you. You run the show. You win. You win. I will win too because I just want to be part of your success. That's all you want. That's all I want, right? And, and, uh, and the devil is not saying that, basically saying, you just bow down, you just fall down and worship. He is not asking Jesus to stay down. This is very important. 
Devil wants your compromise only for that one quick second. That's all he needs. Devil is not asking you to stay down. He's saying just bow down. Just once. That's all you need to do so that we can both win. This temptation is also very, very personal to us. Now, it's interesting what the devil is offering him is the kingdom and the glory. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a way... Uh, there, there's a good theological point and I don't have time to explain but, but take this from me see what is the offer what is the offer the devil is making to uh, Jesus what he says is showed him all the kingdom of the world and their glory and he said to him all these things so what devil can give you is the kingdom and the glory and Jesus says oh that's not what I came here for how do you sell how do you Try to convert Pope into Catholic religion. Because Pope is the Catholic, right? right? You, you, cannot, you cannot make Billy Graham an evangelical because Billy Graham is the, the epitome of evangelicalism, right? You cannot make pastor, you cannot sell IPC to Pastor Walson Abraham. He is IPC, right? Like, you know, they're, they're, they're big. So, so the devil is basically giving him an offer which he didn't want. He's saying, I can give you the kingdom and glory. The funny thing is, Jesus did not come for kingdom and glory. Jesus came for people. See, all devil has authority on is on the kingdom and the glory. Devil has no authority on individuals. This is an important theological point. Hopefully I can explain it later. Always remember that devil has no authority on you because you are created as an independent, individual, free-thinking human being. Devil cannot offer the world, I mean people, only he can offer power. He has power of, over the infrastructure. He has power of the dominion over all this kingdom and the glory. But he has no authority on persons, on individuals. And Jesus came here looking exactly for the opposite. He came here for persons. He came here for individuals. That was not part of the deal for Jesus to take. See, the problem is, even today, the, the tyrants, the political, whoever, does, you know, these this big political figures who, are, who became very uh, tyrants, they, they are all tried to build a kingdom and coerce people into their kingdom. So, because kingdom is what attracts people. But in Jesus' dictionary, it's just the opposite. Once you attract people, they will build their own kingdom. So that's why Jesus said, the kingdom I'm going to build, my kingdom is not of this world. Because the way the world builds the kingdom is that it builds the infrastructure first. It builds the power and the glory of oh, America, Canada, the world, the civilization. And it creates this infrastructure of power and glory and try to coerce and bring in individuals to that kingdom. But the way Jesus does is just the opposite. He wants people. He wants our heart. And once he has our heart, once he has dominion on our heart, we will be able to build that kingdom with Jesus. That kingdom is called the kingdom of God. And he came here for that. So devil's deal is a paradoxically very different from what Jesus was looking for. That's why Jesus said, no deal. I'm not going to take it. The point is, we hear this compromise calls. We almost every single day. Again, nobody has offered us everything in the world. Nobody has taken us to a mountain or high place and shown all the glory and offered this kind of a deal. But on an everyday basis, haven't you heard this voice telling you, let's compromise. Just once. Just once. Just once. Just once. You don't have to stay down, Matthew. You don't have to stay down. Just bow down once. That's all. That's all you need. So, in the wilderness, this is the sound we hear. Use your gift for your own glory. Let's take a shortcut to success. And the third one, let's compromise just once so that we can be in a win-win situation. That's exactly what Jesus heard. And that's exactly what we hear on everyday basis in the wilderness. And what are we going to do about it in that wilderness? Let's look up to Jesus. Let's close our eyes for a quick second. And we are not in this wilderness alone. 
We are not here alone. Jesus had to go through the same thing, same temptation. He had the same voices before us, yet he did not sin. And he is our high priest. When we are weak, when we think we cannot cope up with what we are going through, the struggle, and then he is there. He can sympathize with us because he has identified with our weakness and he has identified with our brokenness. And we can, like him, come out of this wilderness like a, like a butterfly, graduate into another realm. And to the step into the new chapter, God is already writing for our life. 